Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And today... On the Online Great Books Podcast, we're going to be discussing a book that we've talked about many, many times. It's Walker Percy's The Movie Goer. I didn't love it. I wanted to. <laughs> I, I thought after I read it, I thought, no, I should have I should have thrown Love in the Ruins at you. This one's a little too earnest. <sighs> Is it? It tasted like Catcher in the Rye to me. It's like, who gives a shit about this guy's life other than him and his creator? <laughs> <laughs> but, but we got a problem here about what to read next week. I'd like to suggest it's a textbook, Metal Fabrication Technology for Agriculture by Larry Jeffisk. Is there any way we could read that? Because I've got I've got to read a hundred <laughs> pages of that before class next week. <laughs> That'd be a big help. I don't know me. how much is it. <laughs> well, it's ten dollars and twelve cents on e- on eBay, but uh, I don't know that would be compelling. But that's on the top of my list right now. I would have no practical experience of metal fabrication. Yeah. <laughs> talk about the metaphysics of metal fabrication. I I don't know. I could talk about anything, I think. I think so, too. Ah, which brings me to another point. We had a listener email, and I, a, a very kind, very nice email, and he said, uh, he said, I think that the Online Great Books podcast really is probably geared more for existing Online Great Books members, and he didn't think that him forwarding our show to friends of his or family or whatever would be that helpful in getting them to come to read the books, whether with us or by themselves or whatever. He said, it's just, I'll paraphrase too fancy or something. He said it was more like a college course than like our seminar is and, uh, or a college level discussion and, or something. I don't know. You read it, Carl. What did he say? That was about what he said. Yeah. I think he's, I get it. Kind of right. On the other hand, I'm just a barely reformed redneck, and I didn't have a background in this This is true. (laughs) Barely reformed. And I I hope that when we do this show, we demonstrate what normal rednecks (laughs) and other people can do if they read enough and they're taught how to read and how to do what Adler calls a syntopical reading, which is where as you read— you're able to draw on a fund of knowledge you've gotten from other careful readings and take an old idea from an old book you read, Plato maybe, and then read Percy and then see the the ants <laughs> scolding at the end of the book and then come up with a third new synthetic idea that you that was that came of your own mind as a result of all this information you've taken in. <sighs> so unfortunately, they get to see me at least kind of later in this process instead of, you know, when I was 19. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. So my frustration on, on that, I understand, uh, I guess it's a highbrow show. You've, you've, it's hard for me to imagine that it's a highbrow show, but I guess it could be. That's not exactly what he said, but you know. When I had students in the classroom, uh, it was very frustrating and it got more so over the 20 years I did it. I think I had some of my best classes at the beginning. Mm-hmm. But as we went further and further, they would talk less and less. Yeah. And, you know, they would sit there and they want me to tell them what to think about the thing. And frankly, I didn't care what they thought about the thing. Right. They didn't get it. I don't care what thoughts they come out of after reading whatever it was we were reading. Right. I care that they have thoughts. And and the idea that uh, there are experts that you need to listen to, especially, especially in literature, you know, maybe there's somebody who knows how to treat the Ebola virus better than you do. Fine. But there's nobody that knows how to read Walker Percy better than you. Uh, no. You know, you read it and you, you either hate the guy or you you like him or or you understand what's going on. It's about human experience. And you, dear listener, are a human. As far as we know, and you have experiences and you have a mind and you're the only person in the world that is experiencing life as you, which means you are an expert. 
And so what I would like to show with this, <laughs> with this podcast is you can do this stuff. You're sufficient to the task. You can pick up a book. You can read it. It's okay to crap on the book. Uh, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's okay to throw the book across the room. Right. If you have intelligent reasons for doing it, it's all right. I mean, he uh, called it uh, like college level. Okay, well, what if we did high school level? What would that be? Well, yeah. You know, I've got a friend I was talking to one time years ago. We were talking about business writing for business purposes. And he says, well, you know, you've got to write with this eighth grade level. And I said, well, well, what if the concept we're trying to convey is beyond an eighth grader? Like, how, how do you do that? You know? So sometimes if you're talking about important heavy duty things, you can't do it at a junior high or high school level because high school kids, while they can be smart and precocious, or maybe aren't able to. Well, they haven't, most of them have done anything yet. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that we do do that, <laughs> I, that you know, probably doesn't help the regular listener who hasn't read all this, all this stuff is we'll just say something about Aquinas or Hobbes or name drop. And you'll say, well, so-and-so's idea and he treads on so-and-so. Or, or, or not everybody has that and uh, has that fund of knowledge. They don't know what Hobbes said about the nature of man. They don't know what Thomas said about whatever. So, yeah, that's legit. But I don't know how to do it. I mean, I'm, I'm me, and I've read the things I've read, and I can't help, but they're incorporated into me mostly, and I, I can't, I can't shake that. Now, in fairness to the 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 listener that wrote us a letter, I mean, I could see us doing some topical shows. You know, enlightening the load a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Maybe ought to. But you know, I I respect I, I respect the audience, and you know, if it's a stretch, it's a stretch. It's all right. right. You know, we've got over at online great books. These are ordinary people. They are not uh, academics. They're ordinary people with ordinary jobs who have extraordinary insights into the books, because everybody could. If they would just read the darn things. That's all you got to do. Yeah. I love seminars. I love doing seminars. I've got one tonight um, on Seneca. Hmm. And and I worked my way through Seneca. And I'm going to go there and turn it on. And this is going to be, I think, it's pro I think it might be seminar one or seminar seven, something like that. And I'm just going to turn on the Zoom. And they'll probably just talk at me. And I won't even need to do anything yeah. and I'm going to learn what they think about Seneca and it's going to be great Yeah, I'm tired of my own thoughts I want somebody else's thoughts for a while I'm tired of your thoughts too <laughs> yeah a guy named Will he's one of our members he said he wrote in Slack this morning I forgot to add I'm going to paraphrase him here so I'm just going to kind of breeze through this I forgot to add about a eureka moment I had because it, it was cool to see what Adler was talking about regarding the highest level of reading. So that's from Adler's book, How to Read a Book, where he talks about syntopical reading. He says, considering all the works we've read so far through the lens of the one we've just finished reading, I get something called a history high. And he moves on and he says, this is the first time I got that from connecting books before and seeing what the great conversation is. It was easy to connect Homer to Homer, but watching it reach forward and back to illuminate was so very cool. I mean, you've been doing it forever. And uh, I've been doing it for a while. And so, so you know, we just kind of do it on the fly. And it seems, I don't know. Yeah, we just we just seem so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, uh, our, our man John Pascarella, he says, and to think if you're seeing this so early in the program, imagine what connections you'll make years down the road. During a discussion last night, I made note in Prometheus Bound of a couple of things Hobbes incorporates into Leviathan based on that play. If you didn't know, Hobbes translated all of Thucydides. Hobbes and the moderns may break from the Greeks, but to do that, they had to know the Greeks first. The great books are truly wonderful. Yeah, so, you know, Will, our friend Will there, he's in Seminar 60. So he has been a member about, I don't know, I'm going to spitball five or six months, and, and it's starting to happen. Yeah, and we just we just kind of bring that process to the thing, and I don't know. I, if you do the work by and by, you will have that thing. It works every single time. If you do it in earnest, it, you know, 
you you find yourself doing that sort of heavier level of reading and uh, bringing these interesting insights that seem like they're college level, but they're not. They're just for people that do it, that, that do it and care. They're, Experts, they're, but they're more than college level. Yeah, they are. They're more than college level. Yeah, I kind of college is high school part two. We used to say that college was high school with ashtrays, but now you can't smoke there, so I don't know what it is anymore. Yeah, well, because everybody goes now, almost everybody goes. Yeah. Well, I don't, that's enough to say about that. <laughs> uh, should we talk about Walker Percy? I don't know. Did you hate it that much? No, I have to convince no, you that it's not terrible. I didn't hate it that much. The last chapter redeems it. The epilogue? It redeems it. But uh, I didn't love it. I, I, you too. You, listen, you too can do this, and you must. Today will pass, and tomorrow pass, will pass, and next week, and next month, and next year, and the next decade will pass. And will you have done this? You know, will you have read the stuff, and can you make the connections? Does your mind have the fund of knowledge to pull on to see new occurrences through the lens of history and so on? You know, you can do it, and the time is going to pass, so you can uh, do that uh, binge-watching whatever or looking at Sports Illustrated or you can do this stuff, you know, with us, or do it on your own with some friends. And uh, by and by, you'll be talking about you'll, you'll, somebody will say something. You'll go, "Oh yeah, that's the will to power," you know. <laughs> and you'll see things more clearly. You'll see what it is. You, well, you'll see the will to power at your uh... <laughs> when you go to the ocean. <laughs> or uh, I was thinking that the parish council oh. at your church. You'll see the will to power. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it makes your inner life better. You know, you only got one life. Seneca's been hitting me hard, and he's like, he had this one quote last night, something about the shortness of life. Something like, it doesn't matter how long your life is. If you use it wrong, it's short. Right. I like that. So you might as well use it right and read some stuff. Yeah. Uh, And join us. We'd sure be happy. And uh, if you also listen to our music podcast. Mm. So this is one of the things that I am amazed with because I don't know if you know about it, but this gentleman sitting across from me through Zoom, he knows everything about everything <laughs> in music. No. I would never play Trivial Pursuit with him about music. You know, we're going to do Buddy Holly in a in a week or so, and he's make, he's pulling connections out. And, uh, and you can see how music's not just this song that you like on the radio. It's this living thing where... Everything's connected to something else. And what it does is it makes you enjoy the good music more. And hate the bad music <laughs> with a well, that's true. fiery passion. <laughs> Holy crap. Has Buddy made you cry? <laughs> I haven't done Buddy yet. I've, okay. I, I was lingering over Roy Buchanan this week. Yeah, Roy's a good I was going back to Roy. I dug up. I've got some kind of bootleg recordings of Buddy here and there. And I've got some. some I dropped a zip file of uh, the apartment recordings. Um of buddy and uh yeah dig into there i hope you hope you like that stuff uh, now are we ready for walker percy i don't know yeah all right let me try it all right so let's set the stage so i i did not meet walker percy i did see him in person in 1989 uh at the university where i went they gave him an award it was a year before he died this gray-haired frail looking man walked up on the stage and said a few words and i didn't know who he was Right. Had no idea who he was. Then he died the next year. And I discovered his novels. I didn't start with the moviegoer, so I probably shouldn't have started you with it. A couple of years later, when I was probably Binks Bowling's age, a little bit younger than him, and they struck a nerve with me. And I've read them all a million times. That's an overstatement. There's a certain sort of person that I think these novels are, are probably going to be really good for and that's the kind of detached person the the observer the one that goes to the party and sits in the corner and just watches everybody else and sometimes has to think what would an ordinary human do in this situation (laughs) yeah i think that's what he was probably like well i get that i mean i I've always felt like a, an alien and, uh, <laughs> when I observed uh, Homo sapiens in its environment. 
Yeah, and the problem is if you are such a person, you can get really detached and uh, not know what to do with it. A little bit of his life story. He's born in 1916 uh, in Alabama. His uncle was a senator. Another uncle was a Civil War hero, probably for the Confederacy for certain. Let's see. His grandfather committed suicide in 1929. His dad did uh, in 1931. His mother drove off a bridge uh, accidentally, except it doesn't look accidental. So there's some melancholy running in the family. He was raised in in Mississippi with his second cousin, William Alexander Percy, who is also a novelist. You can read some of his stuff. He's good friends with Shelby Foote, whom you may know, the author of that glorious uh, Civil War trilogy, which we might read someday. He went to medical school. I suppose was going to be a doctor. While doing an autopsy, he contracted tuberculosis, which in those days, there wasn't any cure. He just had to go rest. And so went up uh, somewhere in New York, uh, I think for a couple of years. And <laughs> this is where the, the problem happened. He read uh, had nothing else to do but read. So he read Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky, Tom Aquinas. He did kind of what we do, except he didn't start with Aristotle and Homer. Right. And, uh, well, came back and wrote novels. <laughs> Now, this one won the book, whatever, the National Book Award in 1961, so it's a typical one to start with. It's called The Movie Goer. It's about a young man. Binks, I guess, is his name. Everybody's got a nickname. Everything's going right for him. He's 30 years old. He managed to go to Korea and escape without serious injury. He's living in a suburb of New Orleans. He's selling stocks. He is falling in love with his secretaries. Sequentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, making a lot of money, everything seems great. What more could you want? Hmm. Everything else? <laughs> well, how is it? So this is one of the things that I, Percy, it seems to me is, that's one of his big ideas, is how is it possible to be unhappy when everything is, when you should be happy? Yeah. You know, everything's going great. Your family's going great. You've got everything anybody could want. You have you have everything everybody else seems to want. You have, you know, a television and a good car and all the latest kitchen gadgets and you're not happy. Yeah. So let me go to like page four, I think. Right on the first page, uh, he's remembering uh, when his brother had died. His Aunt Emily says, I've got bad news for you, son. She squeezed me tighter than ever. Scotty's dead. Now it's all up to you. It's going to be difficult for you, but I know you're going to act like a soldier. This was true. I could easily act like a soldier. Was that all I had to do? So there's this idea that if you just, if only you know how to act, it'll be good. Right. Bless his heart. <laughs> I'm trying to drag you into this conversation. <laughs> well, I know. Well, I see the problem that it's pointing at. You know, uh -huh. how do you do all the things that you're supposed to do and find fulfillment? And if anybody's ever listened to me for a minute or two, they know that I think that the things that you're supposed to do don't really work and don't help you find fulfillment. You know, if you do what everybody does, you get what everybody gets. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen the suicide rate. But, you know, well, I, I won't butt this yet. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's pointing at a problem, and, I, and he's has a good faith portrayal of, a uh, portrayal, betray, <laughs> portrayal of somebody who's dealing with this. And uh, um, unlike Catcher in the Rye, this man here, uh, so uh, Holden deals with a lot of this in Catcher in the Rye, I think. I've read the thing one time. I... Mm -hmm. I got sick. That's like, enough. I threw most of it up. I purged a lot of it, so I probably don't remember it as much as I should. But unlike Holden, uh, Binks here clings to family in place and does a deeper dive on his own ways of being, and he doesn't flee. He doesn't flee it. So for Holden and Catcher in the Rye, it's, I think the, the main thought is everybody's phony and fake. 
uh, where here the main character is figuring out that he's a phony and a fake. Right. And he's trying not to be. He's trying rather to be. than just say everyone else is terrible. To him, everybody else seems, in his aunt and his, his, uh, his uncle and his mom's family, everybody seems to be doing okay except him and Kate. And Kate. Kate, his, his step-cousin. Uh, I want to read a little bit of the language. I, you know, I'm a fan. I, I like the way Percy writes. Uh, he's talking about going to see movies. So the moviegoer, well, to, to be a moviegoer is kind of to be, to be passive and to watch somebody else. But there's something else about the movie. So he talks on the, on the fourth page about a movie. The movie, he, went, he likes to see movies. I used to do this too sit alone in a theater and watch a movie. The movie was about a man who'd lost his memory in an accident and as a result lost everything, his family, his friends, his money. He found himself a stranger in a strange city. Here he had to make a fresh start, find a new place to live, a new job, a new girl. It was supposed to be a tragedy, his losing all this, and he seemed to suffer a great deal. On the other hand, things were not so bad after all. In no time he found a very picturesque place to live, house put on the river, and a very handsome girl, the local librarian. You know, see, watch these movies where some great event happens, some some tragic event. And I don't know if you experience this, but it, it's kind of fun to put yourself in the position. Hmm. You know, so um everybody likes dystopian movies right now. I don't know. So put put on Hunger Games, a silly little bit of whatever. And and you're watching the Hunger Games and you're thinking, gosh, I wish I'd be chosen to go in the Hunger Games. Everything would be simple. You know, kill or be killed, be done by the end. It, it's Or zombie movies. It's like all the characters are hoping there's a zombie apocalypse. Well, Because now they don't have to go to the cubicle farm. I have a theory. I think we're already in one. I thought one. you might. <laughs> I think we're already in one. There's all these people just uh, looking at their phones, like just bumping into things, walking down the sidewalk. You know, it, uh, it's harder to see the humanity in the people around us than ever before. They don't look up for their phone. And when they do, most of their face is covered and we're there, bro. So we're at the zombie apocalypse, but it's not exciting. It's not exciting. Right. It's yeah. There's supposed to be hordes and you're supposed to get your shotgun and well, I know that's the good and part. escape by the skin of your teeth and, you know, take your family and make a new life somewhere in the wilds where the zombies aren't. You see, that's the attraction of it. The new life. Right. Because the old life has become somehow um, just has a malaise about it. And not just a new life, but like, but new rules too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we should read Twilight. I have some theories about Twilight and its appeal, by the way. <laughs> Do I have to read Twilight? Have to you read my, it? To hear my theories. Do I have to read it first? Uh, no, we could just, we could do a Scott stream about it. Well, anyway, he's got this problem. He he uh, he can't really get excited about anything. He likes to read the political newspapers, and not because he has any particularly strong political opinions, but because he likes the hatred of left and right. It seems real to him. Right. I get that. <laughs> it's very real. You know. You know this this sort of disengagement that he has can lead to an acting out or a thrill seeking, you know, driving too fast, doing drugs, you know, I mean, you know, kind of post adolescence, ad adolescent, you know, lashing out in order to find authenticity. But he, he doesn't do that. He got to he, he so sinks back into his roots more and more, you know, until he ends up at the fish camp, you know, and, uh, Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love the sense of place here. I mean, this is definitely a book by a Southerner. I love New Orleans, and I love leaving New Orleans, but I love the whole sense of place and the sense of time and the sense of family and everything that this guy has. Yeah, I, I wonder if you could write a novel about where I live. I think my place is a no place, mm -hmm. which is another idea he has, that the places we live tend to be unreal, and you're not quite sure if it's real. So there's a scene in the book where William Holden shows up in some some part of New Orleans or some little town. It's in the Garden District, I think. Like this young couple sees him and they have a little exchange with him and then he moves on. And all of a sudden, everything that they've lived in is now more real. Yeah, we have to have everything mediated by 
an expert, man. Or at least somebody that everybody else notices. They're the only thing that I, my little town, which I'm not going to name, it's not that little, it's 50,000 people. I believe an American Idol contestant came from our town, and she did pretty well, and she's... Put you, you guys on, her on YouTube. That's right. That's right. That's why, you know, when you go see the, the comedian and he says, anybody here from Texas? Right. And people will clap. How about Illinois? You know, and people will clap for their hometowns. <laughs> they just like to hear it mentioned. Right. That's the genius of that Route 66 song. Yeah. His name's all those places. And he says, oh, I've been there. I've driven through there. It's funny. I'm real. Okay, so this is a disaffected young man. He's he's a little different from most everybody else. Well, that's a big question. So this, in, in my Kindle edition, is around page 12. There was one day that the publisher put all the Percy novels on sale for like two bucks a piece, and I just mm. bought them all. I have them on paper, too. The beginning quote at the beginning of the book is something from Kierkegaard saying the worst form of despair is to not even know you're in despair. And he says here on page 12, uh, to become aware of the possibility of the search is to be onto something. Not to be onto something is to be in, dis in, in despair. And he talks about poles, at least in 1961. He says to himself, what do you see? God? I hesitate to answer, since all other Americans have settled the matter to, for themselves. To give such an answer would amount to setting myself a goal which everyone else has reached, and therefore raising a question in which no one has the slightest interest. Who wants to be dead last among 180 million Americans? For, as everyone knows, the polls report that 98% of Americans believe in God, and the remaining 2% are atheists and agnostics, which leaves not a single percentage point for a, spe for a seeker. In the next paragraph he ends, Am I in my search 100 miles ahead of my fellow Americans or 100 miles behind them? That is to say, have 98% of Americans already found what I seek, or are they so sunk in everydayness that not even the possibility of a search has occurred to them? Yes. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Nobody examines it. They want to give the pat answer, and nobody even thinks about what the, answer, what the real answer is. Yeah, you were telling me of a conversation you had with a friend you know, why are you so angry? Why can't you just enjoy yourself? Right, man. Like, we're just we're just dust in the wind, bro. Like, why are you upset? Like, we're just here for a little while and then we're gone, man. Why don't you why don't you just let it go, man? Well, that's despair. They won't they won't know it is. I, I was telling you off the air, driving around my town, there's all these signs saying, uh, curious about cannabis. Well, I'm not, but everybody else seems to be chatting with some people the other day. And they're, of course, amazed that I've never, I have never, never used it. Yeah. Why not? Well, to use it would be to give in to everydayness for me. It'd be like to make any notion of a search, any notion of transcendence just go away. You know, who cares? Smoke pot, play video games. Watch Netflix. Yeah, I, I'm not interested in being altered. You know, uh, I enjoy bourbon very much, but I don't like getting drunk. And I rarely drink more than two ounces of bourbon in 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 a, a four hour period or five day mm -hmm. period. I like the way it tastes, but I don't like being altered. I'm very interested in being completely me, which is hard. I don't always get there. But uh, yeah, I don't. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to be altered. Ugh. He makes some comment in here about watching Concrete in the evenings. Everything's okay, right? I said a couple weeks ago on this show, Carl, that optimism was cowardice. That upset some folks. I saw that, <laughs> and I've got some emails too that I didn't send you because they're boring to me. But I, I, yeah, I got some of those emails and. And uh, one of them's from our friend Matt. I'm just going to out him here. Poor Matt. He says, "Man, that's a really tough and sad sentiment. It's of course only true if you have nothing to look forward to. Life is certainly full of suffering. I don't know how I would get through it with an outlook like that." Yeah, exactly. You're you're saying what I said. You have to be optimistic because you can't imagine living without it. It's too scary to see reality on reality's terms. People don't want to do it. 
Yeah, so I was reading uh, with our, our friends in, I think, Seminar 59. I was reading Prometheus Bound on Tuesday, and there's this mind-blowing bit in one of the things that Prometheus has done for human beings. Everybody knows that he gave fire, okay? But there's something else that he did. I have uh, taken from humans their knowledge of their death. Well, how did you do that? I placed in them blind hope. Yeah, blind hope. In some translations, it's vain hope. That's the problem. Because, in, in fact, I think if you have, if you're Promethean and you have the technology, but you don't have vain or blind hope, you have an opportunity to be a better steward of that technology, to use it to fix problems in a specific way. Here is this problem X. Use the technology to fix it in a certain way. But if you have vain hope, in your Prometheus and it's wrapped up in one, right? The, the, you control fire and you have that vain hope. You see salvation through the technology. Like without vain hope, there's no utopianism. Vain, empty hope. Uh, is there such a thing as rational hope? I think so. It seems to me that our character here, Binks, Bowling, he doesn't want to have empty hope. He doesn't want to have vain hope. What 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 do you think his hopes are? Until the end of the book, he doesn't have any. He's hoping to figure it. He, he's the character that knows. He's the person that knows that not all is as it seems. I think that he does have a hope throughout the book, and I think that he hopes that he is able to find meaning in this mundane stuff. Like he's going through the motions, and he's hoping that he can find a way to be fulfilled with the work and the Linda. He, he, what, what are the girls' names? Linda's and, Linda and Sharon and, and Sharon's and one. Marsha's. He's hoping that he can find meaning in all of that and stop going through the motions and actually do it, I think. Yeah. But it's not working. I just love the last bit about him and Kate. We'll, we'll talk. It's too early in the show. We'll get to it. One of the things that he does. So he's a, he's a good looking guy. He's rich. He has secretaries and he has affairs with them. For Percy, this is a, a recurring concern. If you if you ever read any more of his novels, I really think Love in the Ruins you probably like a lot better than this. You know, when you're suffering from malaise, one way out of it is the pretty girl. Don't hurt. For a little while. You can't think about the the, the complete lack of hope and despair that you have when you're with Sharon Kincaid. <laughs> The big country girl. Where's she from? Alabama. Somewhere in Alabama, I think. Splendid Amazonian country girl. Yes. <laughs> Some of the descriptions of their anatomy is entertaining. But, um... Yeah, it's good. A guy the other day who I know, who I won't out, said that a female that we knew had an ass like secretariat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, And he was right. And it's, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> but Walker would have probably put something like that in here. <laughs> he probably would have. You know, the physical, the, the, the joys of the physical is a, it's a way out, except it doesn't last. And then, so if he'd married Sharon Kincaid and enjoyed her for a couple of years, at some point he'd be out walking the levee wondering, what have this I done? You know? Yeah, he's got an aunt, his aunt Emily, for whom everything is correct as well. She she seems to have figured it out. So this is page 23, talking about her desk. Scattered over the satin wood table is the usual litter of quarterlies and rough paper weeklies, and, as always, the great folio, The Life of Buddha. My aunt likes to say she is an Episcopalian by emotion, a Greek by nature, and a Buddhist by choice. She's one of those. Yeah. Well, she seems to have everything together. She's not religious, Carl. She's spiritual, you see. She's spiritual. Uh, Mercer, the, the butler, who has gone through interesting transformations as they've moved from the country to the city. Let's see. Last Christmas, I went looking for him in his rooms over the garage. He wasn't there, but on his bed lay a well-thumbed volume put out by the Rosicrucians called How to Harness Your Secret Powers. The poor bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're all searching for something, but they don't I, they think they're going to find it. And You remember the Rosicrucians? used to have advertisements in Omni Magazine, which was a science magazine put out by the publisher of Penthouse. The Knights of the Rosy Cross. Yeah. 
uh, mystical organization that's going to give you secret knowledge because everybody wants the secret knowledge. Seems like there should be. I can't. I just can't go on if everybody's a dummy. <laughs> if nobody knows what they're doing, I just couldn't live like that. <laughs> There's this blog I read, and I'm not going to tell everybody what it is. You have to find it your own damn self. He was this guy was writing about how. Like government just, you know, it doesn't matter which, which side you're on. This government just doesn't seem to work very well. There's just so much trouble with just everything. And he says, yeah, it's just because there's no good, there aren't any good people. <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, it's so hard to find good help. And he's like, yeah, you can't. There aren't any good people left. Well, that was always my. Everybody's busted. My quick answer to like Seneca, the, the question that young man asked Seneca, why do bad things happen to good people? There aren't any. Right. <laughs> Right. Can I talk about how wonderful New Orleans is? Sure. It has a street called Elysian Fields. This is a town as degenerate and everything that we know it to be has always had huge aspirations to be wonderful, you know? And they do both, I think. It is a very confusing place. You know, his aunt here, I think, is part of that sort of New Orleans culture where she she's a member of a great books group. She lives in a beautiful house in the Garden District. She's trying to, you know, find out she's trying to live the good life and trying to help uh, Banks live the good life and trying to help Kate. And uh, she's heavy handed and ham fisted. But the two of them are in a whipsaw between having a debaucherous, you know, Fat Tuesday and just going to mass and reading the books and keeping their shit between the ditches. And that's the whole town. You know? I love that about it. As opposed to, you know, my town, which is like work real hard, full stop. We don't have a street called Elysian Fields. We have you 80th know? Avenue. Right. 159th Street. Right. Yeah, we don't have anything like that, you know? The thing is, I don't even think our town, my town, has an identity other than the place where some people live. Yeah, so I here I'll, I'll go to the info Galactic page. Elysium Fields is a uh, or Elysium is a conception of the afterlife that developed over time and was maintained by some Greek religious and philosophical sects and cults. Initially separate from the realm of Hades, admission was reserved for mortals related to the gods and other heroes. Uh, the Elysium Fields according to Homer were located on the west edge of the earth. Yeah, it would be like naming your street heaven. <laughs> Or something like that, you know? And it has the ancient Greek illusion. It's New Orleans, you know, a, a, a nod to a nod to culture that went before us. And then of course they've, you know, they've made new culture there. It's just it's wonderful. Binks's problems wouldn't be the same if he was somewhere else. If he was in Chicago, if he was in LA, Houston, New York City, it wouldn't be the it wouldn't be the same, I don't think. I think he'd be worse off probably. I think he would be too. So a book like this, I think, is Topics like what are being dealt with in this book are best dealt with in the South. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what all them Southern writers say. I don't know. It's just, the cities that around me, it's just so big. That if there is a sense of place, I don't know where to find it. I mean, it would be like Applebee's. in, in one Applebee's. block. Yeah. yeah. Well, in the old days, there probably were. So when my dad grew up in Chicago and, uh, for certain people from that age, you wouldn't say which neighborhood you, had, you were from. You'd say which parish you were from. So at least in Catholic Chicago, there would be these little clumps. And you say, oh, you're from, you're from St. Leo or you're from Little Flower. There'd be a sense of place there, but I don't know if it's there right now. Yeah. It's one of my favorite lines from that. There was that movie Talladega Nights. <laughs> Gosh. You want to go get thrown out of Applebee's? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I want to get thrown out of Planet Fitness. All right. What about Kate? So we have this girl, Kate. Mm. Kate is a, I guess, a step cousin. Emily's husband's daughter. Yeah. What about her? She's a mess. I mean, maybe we all are. When Kate gets her hair waved and puts on an evening gown, she looks frumpy. The face in the picture is plain as pudding. Even though she was a queen of the Neptune... You know, she's a member of one of these um, Mardi Gras crews and has been anointed by New Orleans culture as somebody 
somebody to know. But when when she gets her hair waved and puts on her evening gown, there's that. And she goes off the rails, right? She's got everything going for her and she can't stand it. Yeah, and she just when she goes off the rails, I can't remember what they say. They say like she she's gone to what did they say? She's gone to Claremore. I don't remember. They had a, a saying, a <laughs> euphemism for when like she's gone to win. Natchez. Yeah, yeah, that's what is it is. Is that gone, it? Gone to Natchez, which is just a euphemism for uh a bender, but they don't really say what her bender is. Like, is she an IV drug user in 1960? Is she a drunk? But she goes to Natchez and they're like, Oh no, where's Kate? They sent, you know, and it's all hands on deck to find out where she is and, and uh, get her back home safe. And it, it's not clear to me if her going to Natchez is like, she's in peril or if she's just kind of off the reservation, impugning the honor of the family and just needs to come home and, Act right. I, it's not clear to me. They don't say. He hints around at what that might be. But she's definitely struggling, whatever it is. You could probably diagnose Binks and Kate. Mm, please do. I love well, I diagnosing. Couldn't. Oh. You could do some psychology on them and say, well, they have some form of uh, mental illness. They just need some pharmaceuticals. And in fact, Kate does have them and has an incident with a bunch of phenobarbital later in the book. You know, just get the right SSRs. drugs and everything will be right. I don't think that's the point. I, I don't think that this is a novel about mental health and how you fix it. So somewhere else, Walker Percy writes, what if he does it for instance? What if 51% of the population is depressed? Are they in fact depressed? Right. Sometimes circumstances are not enlivening, yes? <laughs> right. If the level of pharmacology in the population becomes so that everybody's on it, then normal isn't normal. Right. Do you know what I mean? Oh, boy, that's a problem. It's a metaphysical problem, isn't it? Like, what does normal mean? (laughs) You know, is it normative? Okay, 51% of people are doing it, so now it's normal. Or or do we have a, a higher standard a transcendent standard of what the human condition is supposed to be like and has been and that we will then compare behaviors to. Sure. And and if 51% of the people who are, you know, physically prosperous, have enough food, have enough of what passes for entertainment, and still they're not happy, then what does that say about what passes for entertainment and food and life? It might right. be that theirs is the reasonable reaction. I was talking to my Uncle Roy the other day. Uncle Roy had one child. My mother had two. Her brother Everett had two, and her brother Henry had three. There were four kids that lived, and my mother had two siblings that didn't make it to 10 years old. So there were six of those Cox kids. The six Cox children, four of them lived, ended up having six, nine total kids. They have... I don't even know how many cousins my mother has. So my mom's mother's siblings, dozens of them, dozens of children. If the material conditions of society are such that no one wants to reproduce, (laughs) is it better now than it was when those people were having six, ten, four children all the time? And listen, I don't want to hear about birth control pills. Like, people know how this stuff works. And they've known for a long time. I don't want to hear about that. Like, people can people knew how that worked in 1931, 1915, 1945. People knew how that worked. My mother's family was very, very, very poor. Very poor. But they chose to have kids in the face of all of that. You know, so if you have material plenty but you don't want kids. I don't know. Go figure it out for yourself. You know, is, is it better now or was it better? Then? Like figure it out. Like what's normal. How's normal working in 1941? How's normal working in 2021? I don't know, man, get your own scoreboard out and try to figure it out. Well, the answer would be something about population control. Oh no, 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 no. I'm not buying that. Well, I'm not buying it either. I'm just saying what it would be. But you know the young a lot of the young people I know they don't have any interest in kids. Right. 
So humans do not breed well in captivity. We are like pandas. <laughs> pandas are the stupidest animals in the world. Maybe they're maybe they're not. Maybe they're smart. Maybe they're super smart and they're all suffering existential angst. Huh. And that's why they're not interested in the lady pandas. Right. Because they have no hope. They know they're just being kept in cages to promote uh, China's interests. Maybe. <laughs> and uh, to have a family is an act of hope. Yeah, yeah. Vain hope. And if you've got nothing much to hope for but, you know, medical cannabis and the latest, what was the game that came out that bombed? Oh my Cyberpunk God. 2077, whatever yeah. it was. If that's it, you know, why? to go through the effort that it takes to, to have children seems just, no, you, you wouldn't do it. You have to hope in something. Either, I, I've been talking about Seneca a bunch, either like the preservation of Rome. You have to have something that you hope for. Mm -hmm. Binks is Catholic mom who went off and had six kids with her second husband. I don't think this novel is so far from everybody's experience. It's not as funny as Love in the Ruins. I should have started you with that. But I think there's a whole bunch of Binks Ballings is walking around. They just might not know it. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I love his love for all the people around him. And he has the handicapped half-brother, Lenny, Lonnie, Larry. Lonnie. Lonnie. <laughs> and he brings... Um, Sharon, I believe, to the fish camp, and they see him. And the kid's handicapped. He's in a wheelchair. And he, Yeah. I thought that was funny. So he's got Sharon all to himself, takes her down to the Gulf. They go swimming. He's just enraptured by her form and figure. And he's going to go to their secret fishing camp and have a weekend and do things that he probably shouldn't be doing. And his whole family's there. Mom's there. Yeah oops, and <laughs> invites her in, and they have... He gets C-blocked over there, but <laughs> but he does a bellyache <laughs> about it once. You know, he's like, there they are, and he, they just join in the fish fry, and Sharon jumps in there with mom, and and he gets to see this this half-brother of his, and uh, later on, they leave, and Sharon's in tears, and she's like, oh, your brother... He He doesn't feel sorry for Lonnie at all. Did you catch that? Yeah. He just loves the guy... And wants good for him, and that's it. Well, there's something. What is there about Lonnie? He doesn't have to do a three score and ten over it, right? Well, Lonnie's not going to live too long. Yeah, he's not healthy. Lonnie knows exactly what Binks is talking about when he talks about the search. He had the same problem, probably. He's come to his understanding of it for him. It's, a, it's this big Catholic family. They all go to church on Sunday. Lonnie's the one that's real serious about it. The rest of them don't talk about it, which I found interesting. Genuinely religious people don't really want to talk about it. The one that wants to talk about it, be a little suspicious. Like we have a guy in our church, a good friend of mine. His family has quit coming for whatever reason. So he's the only one that shows up. He comes, we stand in our church, and he comes and he stands you know, in the left corner near us, all by himself. Doesn't talk about it, but for him it's important and he does it. You know, it's not it's not for show or for anything. It's just, fine, the rest of the family's not going to come. I'm going to go do it. Yep. I think he's probably more faithful than I am. Generally, religious people aren't necessarily going to talk about it that much. Well, anyway, Lonnie and Binks can talk about it. Lonnie, for him, his religion has become his source of hope. And he actually believes it, mm -hmm. or seems to. Binks doesn't believe a word of it, but he respects that Lonnie has done this, and he, he'll talk to him about Catholic theology. Lonnie wants to fast for Lent, even like though he's already underweight pounds, and sick. Right? Just, you weigh 80 pounds, you shouldn't do this. And Binks, who doesn't believe a word of it, is saying, well, but he, he doesn't mock him. He says, no. well, why don't you, you have reasonable grounds to be, absolved of your responsibility to fast, why don't you meditate on the Eucharist instead? The non-believer is telling the believer how he ought to approach his faith, but on terms that the believer believes, not saying, well, you should get rid of all of this and realize that it's all crap. I love Lonnie and Binks. I do too. 
and he's completely uh, being seems to be. Uh, he cares about immigrant deal, and he is uh, open eyed about what is going on there. Uh, there are things that be, that Lonnie can't do because of his condition, whatever that is. It's never described, but there are other things he can do. You think it's polio? Probably. There are things he can do. And he knows that uh, Lonnie seems to be pretty complete in those things. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't tell him everything will be all right. No. Yeah, that's great. Well, we left off on Kate. Don't worry about a thing. (laughs) Don't worry, nothing's going to be all right. (laughs) That's right. So you have these people that, that know that something's up. And you have Lonnie who's figured out a way around it. And you have Binks and Kate who haven't. And then everybody else who doesn't seem to know that there's a problem. So Kate has been going to Natchez. She's been running. From time to time, she just runs. She just disappears. And uh, mm-hmm. Aunt Emily's always trying to get Binks to talk some sense into her, essentially. And at the end of the book, we find out that Kate just can't face it. She just doesn't think she's up to it. It. She just yeah, it might be diagnosed it. as social anxiety or something like that. You know, you might give her a pill. I think today that's what they'd say, but I think it's bigger than that. It's not just anxiety. It's not like, oh, uh, there are a lot of people here and I'm nervous and I don't know what to say. She legitimately, I think, doesn't think she's up to grappling with the world. Well, okay, disclaimer. There are people for whom the pharmaceuticals are probably the appropriate solution. All right, that's the end. Okay, but I don't think it would help Kate. Nope. In fact, she has a doctor who treats her, and it, she feels good when she talks to the doctor, and then she comes home, and that's no good. I think what it is, so there was this, she had a, a young man, Lyle, that she was going to marry, and they were out having a wonderful weekend. They went to a football game, and as they were driving back, he goes to pass and runs head on into a truck full of farm workers, and he dies. And she wakes up on the porch of some house and hears that he's dead. Well, she's probably relieved, but, well, it's not to say that she didn't love him, but rather than go home and have everybody talk to her and say, oh, you poor dear, she goes off somewhere else for a while, you know, riding a bus and living anonymously, and it's the happiest thing she can think of, Mm -hmm. so that she doesn't have to go and act like everybody thinks she ought to act. For me, the the moviegoer, the title itself and the idea of these movies is the movies tell you how to act in situations. Well, what if you don't have a movie? You know, or in modern terms, I have to go on Instagram and see what the influencers are doing to learn how to be me. Binks makes these pop culture references. He talks about William Holden and, and whoever. But he really doesn't talk about movies that very much. And he doesn't go to movies very much in this. Life is a movie for him. He's a spectator in life until the end of the book, Mm -hmm. I think is what it's about. Yeah. Um, So at the end of the book, 233, this is the best, well, the second best part. I don't know, maybe the first part. Kate and Binks get married, end up getting married. He accidentally proposes to her. Yeah. He accidentally proposes and she kind of lets it hang for a little bit, but... uh, Binks' aunt has been on him to go to medical school for quite some time. His father was a doctor, and uh, she'd like him to do that. And uh, Kate says, are you going to medical school? And he says, if she wants me to. Does that mean you can't marry me now? No, you have plenty of money. And Kate says, then let (laughs) us understand each other. All right. I don't know whether I can succeed. I know you don't. It seems the wildest sort of thing to do. Yes. We'd better make it fast. All right. Okay, it says, I'm so afraid. And then, if I could be sure you knew how frightened I am, it would be a, a help a great deal. And he says, you can be sure. Not merely of marriage, but this afternoon I wanted some cigarettes, but the thought of going to the drugstore turned me to jelly. I'm silent. He's good at that, by the way. He can just sit and listen to people. Binks can. Mm-hmm. And Kate says, I'm frightened when I'm alone and I'm frightened when I'm with people. The only time I'm not frightened is when I'm with you. You'll have to be with me a great deal. I will. Do you want to? Yes. I will be under a long under treatment a long time. I know that. And I'm not sure I'll ever change. I mean, really change. He says, you might. 
but I think I see a way. It seems to me that if we are together a great deal and you tell me the simplest things and not laugh at me, I beg you for pity's own sake, never to laugh at me. Tell me things like, Kate, it's all right for you to go down to the drugstore and give me a kiss. Then I will believe you. Will you do that? Yes, I'll do that. And she has started plucking at her thumb in earnest, tearing away little shreds of flesh. I take her hand and kiss the blood. But you must try not to hurt yourself so much. I, I will try. I will. So she tells him exactly what she needs. And then the last page of the book, I'm going to cry. <laughs> He says, will you do me a favor? And she says, what? I'll be up here all day with Lonnie and the children. Lonnie dies. Will you go downtown for me and pick up some governments at the office? He's talking about bonds. Your mother has decided again to keep them at home. She thinks that if war comes, her desk was safer than the vault. Will you go alone? Yes, you can ride the streetcar down St. Charles. It is nice sitting by an open window. I wouldn't know what to ask for. You don't have to. I'll have Mr. Klosterman. I'll call Mr. Klosterman and he'll hand you an envelope. Here's what you do. Take the streetcar. Get off at Common. Walk right into the office. Mr. Klosterman will give you an envelope. You won't have to say a word. Then catch the streetcar at the same place. It will go down to Canal and come right back up St. Charles. I don't have any money. Here. She considers the quarter in her palm. Here's the only thing. It's not that I'm afraid. She looks at a Cape Jasmine sticking through an iron fence. I pick it up and give it to her. You're sweet, St. Kate says uneasily. Now tell me. What? While I'm on the streetcar, are you going to be thinking about me? Yes. What if I don't make it? Get off and walk home. I've got to be sure about one thing. What? I'm going to sit next to the window on the lakeside and put the Cape Jasmine in my lap? That's right. And you'll be thinking of me just that way? That's right. Goodbye. Twenty feet away, she turns around. Mr. Klosterman? Mr. Klosterman. I watch her walk toward St. Charles, Cape Jasmine held against her cheek, until my brothers and sisters call out behind me. Ugh. All right. So what's going on there? Ah, she just needed the simplest reassurance. You know, she's supposed to be the queen of the Neptune crew and have all these sort of aspirations. And Emily wants her and and Emily wants her and Binks to essentially be like her, to read their great books and, and talk about music and live in the garden uh, in the garden district and be okay with everything. But neither one of them can do that. Mm-hmm. Him because he, wa- he wonders or hopes that there's something else in her because she's not equipped. Like she has trouble buying smokes and mm-hmm. she needs a plain and simple love that keeps her rooted in the world. Are you thinking of me? Will you be thinking of me in that way? Will you picture me against the window, looking out the window on the St. Charles line with the jasmine in my lap? Yes. She needs to know that she matters, and she needs to know that people think about her, and she needs reassurance. And not every guy could do that, but at this end of the book, I get the sense that he can do that. That would be exhausting <laughs> in year 30, <laughs> but I get the sense that he could do it. He could do it. So this man who has no hope has found, although we don't know quite how, at the end of the book, some source of it. We, you get the sense that things are better. He's married, which is an act of hope, as much as having children. It's funny that he read Kierkegaard so much, because Kierkegaard had this girl that he was going to marry, but he couldn't. Mm. I forget her name. Writes about it in the journals, and he, he just couldn't do it. But to not just fool around with Sharon on the Gulf Coast, as fun as that would be, but to actually enter into a marriage with an actual human being is an act of hope, especially one that you have to care for. Probably there's some, he's probably come to terms with religion to some degree, mm-hmm. although he's not going to talk about it. See, that's part of the sign that mm-hmm. he doesn't talk about it. He says on 237, I'm a member of my mother's family after all, and so naturally shy away from the subject of religion. A peculiar word, this in the first place, religion, it's something to be suspicious of. He's not going to talk about that. There's that, and he's found a way to do it. I think she's his way to do it, to have somebody to care for that's not him. And, I don't know if this is too literary theory, Lonnie's gone. You know, Lonnie, who needs this care, is is gone when when this thing happens, when, when Percy tells this, by the time Percy st- tells the story about how Kate and 
Binks Interact. Well, I was just thinking about, uh, I, I've read a, quite a bit on Walker Percy. I think I might have given the biography away, but I, I've read a, a bunch. That after he had his experience with the tuberculosis and, you know, <laughs> spending the whole time reading existentialist writing, which, gosh, that's something when you're in the sanitarium to read Dostoevsky. Uh, but one of the first things he does is he comes back home and he he marries the girl that he'd known before, but had never, mm -hmm. uh, Mary Bernice was her name, went back and married her, you know, did the deed. When you're a moviegoer, it's hard to do things when you have that attitude about life, that, that life is a thing that happens to other people. It's hard to commit and make an actual movement because it might matter. I mean, there's a discussion of the character's father. Some of this is autobiographical. But Binks's father, I guess it was World War II, there was a time when he quit eating. He wasn't interested enough in life to eat. And so his wife would read him a novel and fed him and got him fattened up again. And then it was going to, it started happening again, but war was declared. Okay, and suddenly he got very excited. A something was happening. You know, the father was like the son. Mm-hmm. I mean, people get excited about wars. It's the weirdest thing. I remember, it's not the weirdest thing. I understand it, but it's, I remember Gulf War number one. We're still on Gulf. Number one. I don't want to be political, but Gulf, yeah, Gulf War number one. I remember the Super Bowl. This is back when I used to watch sports. And I believe, what's her name? Whitney Houston? The, the singer. Whitney Houston? Yeah, Whitney Houston. She sang the Star Spangled. She actually lip synced it, but she sang the Star Spangled Banner, and it was, I think, Quincy Jones arranged it or something. It was a fantastic mm -hmm. arrangement, and she sang it, and everybody was cheering. This is 1991. Everyone was cheering, and the Jets went over, and mm -hmm. shouts of USA, and they're all so happy that we were invading Kuwait, or that we were liberating Kuwait, mm -hmm. because it was something that was happening. You know, you would think, why is everybody so happy about this? But they were. Well, you know, having read this sort of stuff, I would say, well, everyone's in a malaise and they don't know it. And then a world event happens and they they can finally say, oh, I'm on a team. You know, I'm part of something. Right. I'm, I'm very excited. This We were talking about the dystopian movies before. Everybody wants a zombie apocalypse. They secretly want one. Because at least something would be happening that would be better than Cubicle Job and Cronkite in the Evening, or whoever's the modern Cronkite. That's kind of what self-harm is about. You know, at least I'm feeling something. Yeah, yeah, I like chili. She's got a little of that, a little self-harm. I like the habaneros because at least I can feel. I want to talk about Kate more. <laughs> yeah. What the hell happened to her? Like Early in the book, she's kind of a kind of a flapper like it's 1960 but you know she's smoking her cigarettes she's drinking she's up all night you know she drives a pretty modest car 51 plymouth but she's quick to laugh running around has this date with that guy and dates with this guy and everybody's interested in her and then at the end it's all all that's gone and she's like can you just tell me you'll remember me while i'm going to pick up a package mm -hmm. what happened that's to probably her? all she ever yeah, I think you're right. I think that's all she ever wanted. But what jarred her so that she dropped all the artifice, was it just him? Was it his willingness to listen and to believe her and never laugh? Well, they went on the trip to Chicago. Yeah. The impromptu trip, trip to Chicago. And he takes her with him. And that's when the proposal happens. Is that right? I think so. What does the trip mean for her? I, I don't have a, a real answer for you, but yeah, I think it's just what she always wanted. Uh, all of this other stuff, if you don't know how to be, I hate these words, but you know, the authentic self, if you don't know how to actually live, you're going to do all sorts of things that everyone else does. And you might do more and more extreme things to try to get some sense of being real, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Those are dangerous waters to tread in. But people who... Uh, all of you people out there who have all the tattoos and piercings, okay, that's fine. It's great. All right. When I was young, nobody had them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, everybody I knew with a tattoo, you'd say, well, why'd you get a tattoo? I was drunk. 
I was in the Merchant Marine. I was drunk. Whatever. Okay. And then somewhere around 1990, 19, maybe a little earlier. 2000? I don't know, Carl. Started to be more. Well, Oklahoma would be a little slower. Okay. Fine. Than environs of Chicago. It's like when we go up to Wisconsin, all of their hairstyles are 15 years late. I remember going to Broken Bow, Oklahoma in the early 80s, and guys had ducktail haircuts. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny if you ride the train back in the day, nobody's riding the train anymore, but the train from, goes from Chicago to Joliet. And so yeah. if you take it all the way to Joliet, you can see the differences in style of the people. And so in Chicago, the people that get on at LaSalle Street Station, they're they're very they're very stylish for Chicago. Not New York style, but Chicago style. And you go through um like Blue Island and you, you turn south and go s- southwest and you get out to Joliet and the hair gets bigger and bigger. I met a guy the other day, neighbor guy. He said, Come over to my place, I'll show you around. So jump in the truck, we went up there. And he said, And this is my wife, so and so, and whatever. Had a nice time, super nice guy. Went home and Charity said, well, what was that like? I said, well, they've got this. And, you know, he's a beekeeper, you know, just met his wife. And he, she, Charity said, what's she like? I said, she's Owasa fancy. Charity said, oh, yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, back to the tattoos. So the, the <laughs> tattoos and the piercings, okay, they started as little things. And it, the people that had them would be a little bit off, you know? The scary kid in my high school had some piercings. He was a guy that would cut himself with a razor blade, and I knew that he dealt drugs too, you know? Scary. Well, now it's not scary anymore. So people would go to do the scary. And now you've got so many people with so many tattoos and piercings. They're chasing something, and if I were to read it like Percy would, you know, at least I feel real. You're trying to get, you're you're doing something permanent. I understand it, you know? It, by doing a body modification, a permanent body modification, you're at least affecting reality in some way. But it won't last, which is why you have to get 12 more tattoos. I talked to a stripper one time, Carl. She had a lot of tattoos. I said, hey, what's up with all the tattoos? She's like, well, you know, I like this one here of the unicorn. I said, no, cut the shit. Like, what? what is going on? Like, you've got, you don't have like two <laughs> tattoos. Like, what's going on? And uh, she kept telling me all these stupid stories. Like, when I look at this, it reminds me of my grandma. I was like, no, no, no. Like, and like I remember my grandma too because I have pictures of her and letters that she wrote me and all that. But I don't have a picture. I don't have any tattoos. We talked about it a little more. And she finally said, well, I'm never naked when I have these. Hmm. I think the fact that their people are actually altering their bodies gives them a sense of control. Yep. And they're never naked. And I also think that for some people, it probably, I, I, people are going to hate me for this. And I don't care because my old lady loves me. <laughs> I think there's some self harm in it too. I think it's akin to cutting. Yeah. I'm bringing it up as an example of, of Kate's behavior, which would just keep going more and more because the little things aren't enough. Oh, she would be. This isn't a matter of judgment or anything. I completely understand it. It seems to me thoroughly appropriate in the deracinated, de-agent time that we live in mm-hmm. to go get a bunch of tattoos. Yeah. You know, I, I understand it completely. The reason you and I don't have them probably has more to do with when we were born than anything else. Yes. I mean, we've we've certainly chosen to. Uh, this is about free will, isn't it? Well, but the but the fact that we another said reason. no probably has more to do with it. What? Well, uh, you've seen me in the pool. I don't have a lot of bare canvas. Well, I know, but you know, like our buddy Reynolds, like he's got all these tattoos, and he shaves his body like a lady. <laughs> you guys forward that forward that to Matt for me, by the way, Matt Reynolds. <laughs> I don't think he would deny it. No, he wouldn't. He, no, he wouldn't. He's he's like, oh, Hamburg, you got to get one of these things here. And I'm like, what? And he pulls this like curved stick out of the bathroom, and it's got a razor on the end of it. He's like, he's a giant guy. He's like six six feet tall and 300 pounds. He's got a 700 pound deadlift. So uh, you know, he can't touch. Is it the back blade? Back. Right. Yeah. He's got got this a razor on a big big long stick. He's like, oh, I can shave the middle of my back with this. I'm like. I don't need to shave the middle of my back, Matt. 
He's like, oh, yeah, I do. You look like hell. And I'm like, that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, what are you talking about? Yeah, so they go on this trip to Chicago, and his uh, his business partner says, hey, I need you to go to, go, to uh, go on this trip. You take the 1030 plane Tuesday morning, says Uncle Jules, in his gruff way of conferring favors. Where to? Where to? Why, goddamn Chicago. And then Pink says, Chicago, misery, misery, son of a bitch of all miseries. Not in a thousand years can I explain it to Uncle Jules, but it's no small. <laughs> I laughed and laughed and laughed because I knew I was reading it here. And then Carl is near Chicago. <laughs> yes. Uh, is nothing for him to close his eyes in New Orleans, wake up in San Francisco, and think the same thoughts on Telegraph Hill that he thought on Carondelet Street. Uh, it is my fortune and misfortune to know how the spirit presence of a strange place can enrich a man or rob a man, but never leave him alone. If a mm-hmm. man travels lightly to a hundred strange cities and cares nothing for the risk he takes, he may find himself no one and nowhere. Yep. Well, I've been telling you, I've been oppressed by memory Yeah. for the past six months or so. You know, every place you go has, I wouldn't call them ghosts. You just look at the shape of the buildings and you just, now, who built that? And how did they live? And they're not here anymore. Mm-hmm. Where did they go? What happened? All right, so we go to one of those weird churches, all right? We have onion domes on the top. <laughs> There's a place you can go in Joliet. Joliet's this town out to the west of us. It's where the the Blues Brothers were from. That's the, the, the Chicagoist movie of Chicago movies, by the way, if you haven't ever seen that. It's where Rudy was from, Rudiger from the movie. I met him. One of his cousins or something goes to our church. But you go out to where the steel mills were. They're not there anymore. And there's big steel mills that you can go and tour and you can see the slag heaps and everything. And it's not in a great part of town anymore. There's The, the houses are all falling down. There's this little onion dome church. Mm-hmm. It used to be there. Where'd they go? What happened? You know, there's ghosts there. There was neighborhoods. There were people bringing their families and raising them. A bunch of Slavic people coming and and working in the steel mills all day. Probably dad worked 12 hours a day and then came home and went to church on Sunday. And and, uh, they're all gone. I can't be a tourist there. I can't just say, oh, look, the slag heap. Mm -hmm. Because I'm thinking of, of everything that went before. Does that make any sense? Yep. So you can't just go to Chicago, or at least Binks can't just go to Chicago and be a nobody from nowhere, because he's going to go there and he's going to be hit by the ghosts of the place. And there are some. And he can't think the same kind of thoughts there that he can think in New Orleans. Yeah. So if I go to a different place, am I going to think different thoughts? Yes. Hmm. Better or worse? Depends on where you go. Fargo. I don't know, man. I've never been to Fargo. Can't talk about it. I just love the name Fargo. Yeah, that's pretty good. I've never been to Fargo, but I love the name. It's (sighs) like you got to go far to get to Fargo. Uh, But I think that might be the start of him taking care of her. And he says, go go make the arrangements. Here's the money. Go make the arrangements for the the train trip. They don't take a plane. They take a train. Because she can't, doesn't want to be on a plane. Yeah, and I think a train's probably, f- from Binks' standpoint, is probably a better way to travel anyway because you're not just in a tube and then appear someplace else. Right. You get to see the landscape moving. Yeah, I, I, airplanes for me are time machines. I, got, I fall asleep on them every time. And then you wake up in another time zone and time has passed and it's like, yeah, it's always a time machine for me. It's stupid. I think Charity's going to get me on a, airplane again here pretty soon not very happy about it oh no you know look at the bright side you might be on a list they might not let you (laughs) yeah maybe Uh, I don't know I like this book well Carl I liked it too but there's a whole lot of reading that I had to do to get to the end and have uh, Aunt Emily chew his ass out, and then see them get married. What did you think of her speech? I, I'm looking for it here. Five. This is on page 219. Kate had gone to Natchez again. 
And Binks says, hey, let's go to Chicago with me. Here's some money. Go book some tickets on the train or whatever. So they go. 12 hours after she'd taken a, a couple phenobarbitals. Right. Yeah. So Aunt Emily is worried about her, and they go, and they're just young people gone together. And he doesn't tell Aunt Emily where she is. As Aunt Emily has the cops out and looking for her, and uh, he says, I'm sorry that through a misunderstanding or thoughtlessness on my part, you were not told of Kate's plans to go with me to Chicago. No doubt it was my thoughtlessness. In any case, I am sorry, and I hope that your anger. She cuts him off and says, Anger? You're mistaken. It was not anger. It was discovery. Discovery of what? Discovery that someone in whom you had placed great hopes was suddenly not there. It's like leaning on what seems to be a good stalwart shoulder and feeling it go all mushy and queer. We both gazed down at the letter opener, the soft iron sword she has withdrawn from the grasp of the helmeted figure on the inkstand. I'm sorry for that. The fact you are a stranger to me is perhaps my fault. It was stupid of me to not believe it earlier. For now, I do believe that you're not capable of caring for anyone, Kate, Jules, or myself, no more than that Negro man walking down the street. Less so, in fact, since I have a hunch that he and I would discover some slight tradition in common. She seems to notice for the first time that the tip of the blade is bent. I honestly don't believe it occurred to you to let us know that you and Kate were leaving, even though you knew how desperately sick she was. I truly do not think it would ever occur to you that you were abusing a sacred trust and carrying that poor child off on a fantastic trip like that, or that you were betraying the great trust and affection she has for you. Well, he doesn't give any answers. Well, he shouldn't. Emily's right. This is all about Emily. Emily thought that he was a certain way that Kate's a poor child, you know, and that he took her off on a fantastic trip. He took her on a, he's like tag along on this business trip. I have to make anyway. It wasn't like they Mm -hmm. went to Costa Rica or, you know, in some lark or something. Were you intimate with Kate? Intimate? Yes. Not very. I ask you again, were you intimate with her? <laughs> I suppose so, though intimate is not quite the word. You suppose so? Intimate is not quite the word? I, I wonder what is the word? You, you see, she says with a sort of humor, there is another of my hidden assumptions. All these years I've been assuming that between us words mean roughly the same thing, that among certain people, gentlefolk, I don't mind calling them, there exists a certain set of meanings held in common, that a certain manner and a gra- certain grace come as naturally as breathing, at the great moments of life, success, failure, marriage, death, our kind of folks have always possessed a native instinct for behavior, natural piety or grace, I don't mind calling it. Whatever else we did or failed to do, we always had that. I'll make you a little confession. I am not ashamed to use the word class. And she goes on for the next piece. I, I don't want to read the whole thing, but it goes deeper where she talks about how our moral fiber is rotten and how that we can't have that demeanor and that comportment without the virtue and the moral fiber. She says, our national character stinks to high heaven, but we are kinder than ever. That's true. That's true. I mean, it's very true. All of this is true. See, I think she's a stoic. Okay. She's got a sense of nobility. She's yeah. going to do her duty. Uh, the world might fall down around her, but Aunt Emily's self-understanding is she's one of the noble ones. She's going to hold it together as much as she can as she wanted Binks to be one of them. And he's not. There's a little detail. Uh, you mentioned the the letter opener. Yeah. He had bent it when he was a kid. I cannot tear my eyes from the sword. Years ago, I bent the tip trying to open a drawer. My aunt looks to <laughs> Does she suspect? Uh, <laughs> the whole time she's giving this speech and he's worried about that she's going to yell at him for bending the Letter opener. She says, nor is there anything new about thievery, lewdness, lying, adultery. What is new is that in our time, liars and thieves and whores and adulterers wish also to be congratulated and are congratulated by the great public if their confession is sufficiently psychological or strikes sufficiently heartfelt and authentic notes of sincerity. Oh, we're sincere. I do not deny it. I don't know anyone nowadays who is not sincere. Dee Dee Lovell is the most sincere person I know. Every time she crawls in bed with somebody else, she does so with the utmost sincerity. We are mo- the most sincere Laodiceans. How do you say that? Whoever got flushed down the sea of history. No, my young friend, I'm not ashamed to use the word class. They say out there, we think we're better. You're damn right we're better and don't think they don't know it. Yeah, but he doesn't give any answer to all of this. 
Do you condone your behavior with Kate? I don't suppose so. He didn't do anything with her, by the way. No. The uh, spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. <laughs> what, she fall asleep or something? I can't remember. Uh, I don't think he was able to do whatever he, they might have signed up for. What do you love? What do you live by? I am silent. Tell me where I've failed you. You haven't. So Kate, the aunt just reams him out and then he leaves. Kate hails me at the corner. She leans into my MG, taking her blouse as brisk as a stewardess. You're stupid, 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 she says with a malevolent look. What? I heard it all, you poor, stupid bastard. Because <laughs> he could have cleaned all of it up if he'd have just said that they got engaged. It was probably secretly yep. Aunt Emily's fondest dream and hope that they would be. And he just lets her just froth at the mouth and point at him and shake her finger and rail. And all he could have said was, hey, listen, we're getting married next November. And she would have just deflated like a balloon. <laughs> but he can listen, you know, he can listen and let people do whatever they're going to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's worth reading. It won a book award. Uh, he got better. Later books are better. I think it, it is not my. Favorite. I love Love in the Ruins. Yeah, yeah. I Love in the Ruins is my no. Lancelot's probably my favorite. Shelby Foote wrote a few novels. I think he's got one, Love in a Dry Season, which I've read. Um, for sure, Southern Gothic. You know, um, interesting. Yeah, Love in a Dry Season. That's fun, interesting that Percy has you know Love in the Ruins. So I'll have to re I'll have to read that and compare and contrast. Yeah, well, there's a big split in the country uh, between right and left, and uh, you don't say. There's a schismatic American church that has a feast of property rights. This makes me laugh. Property rights Sunday, right? In love in the ruins, the doctor in that story he invents an ontological lapsometer. It's a medical device where you can tell the ontological status of the people you use it on. Yeah, I could go for this book. Uh, I don't want it to say any more because I'll spoil it for you. Hopefully you'll read it someday. Yeah, we'll read it. We'll read it on here. Episode 675, Walker Percy's Love in the Room. <laughs> what episode are we on right now? 107? Something like that. Put it on the Infinity Stack. When people email and say, hey, you know, you should read... X. I always say, yeah, we'll do that. We'll put it on the infinity stack. Mm -hmm. So when they're like, uh, you should read, um, oh my gosh, I just forgot. Danielle Steele's, you know, whatever novel. I'm like, yeah, we'll put that on the infinity stack. It's a perfect answer for everything. Mm -hmm. You bet. We're we'll not saying that. no. Right. Yeah, we'll put it on the infinity stack. It's deep, deep on the stack. I didn't love it, Carl. Although I did love Kate's simple honesty at the end of the thing and her mm -hmm. willingness to be that bear with him and to rely on him um, is, is so good. The, reading the 234 pages it took me to get to that was well, well worth it, at least for me. The first 234 yeah. pages, they're not junk at all or anything like that. But the, just the line there at the beginning, and you'll be thinking of me just that way. Like she wants to know how he thinks of her, like in what way and what image he carries. In. It just broke my heart. I feel like the main character quite a bit. Sure. It had some appeal for me. Uh, if you are interested in Walker Percy's writings, we do. Mm. We love an essay of his called The Loss of the Creature, which explains kind of what we're trying to do, uh, trying to recover original experiences of things. That's why we don't read secondary literature. So we do that in gateway sessions over at OGB, which are ways that you for free can see what a seminar is like yeah. and uh, come join us. He wrote uh, a bunch of essays, which are, I think really, really good. Yeah. He's got a little thing about drinking bourbon which you can find on the internet, Walker Percy Bourbon, you'll find it. That one's good. I drink early times in honor of him because that's the one that he uses in the uh, in the essay. He does some calculation about dollars per, per unit of enjoyment, and early times hits the sweet spot. <laughs> Rhetoric is too expensive. Well, I'll tell you what hits the sweet spot nowadays. 
Evan Williams bottled in bond. Yeah, it's pretty good. No age statement on it or anything, but dollar for flavor. Tip top, man. Yeah. Well, that's why I have gone to the the white liquors. Oh, yeah. Vodka and gin, because I enjoy it, and they're cheap. Right. And I get more more pleasure per dollar. He has a, a book called Lost in the Cosmos, The Last Self-Help Book, which I love. Uh, which, if you've been reading with us, you'll recognize a whole bunch of mechanical for Leibowitz in that one. Speaking of syntopical reading, just, you know, light, fun reading about living at the end of time and uh, how to deal with it. Yeah, so, syntopical he, reading. He's a friend of mine. Experts. What are we going to do next week? Well, my friend Carl, he said, let's read a little Leo Strauss. So I think we're going to read, are we going to read one essay or are we going to read three? Mm, okay. Might as well do three. They're short. Okay. We're going to read uh, Leo Strauss's three essays, Exoteric Teaching, number two, On a Forgotten Kind of Writing, number three, Persecution and the Art of Writing. Yeah, we're going to read yeah. read those three little goodies. That'll be that'll be fun. I, I think I'm looking forward to that. And I'll short. also be reading about... Um, Metal Fabrication for Agriculture by <laughs> Jeffus. Yeah, and uh, The New Organon by Francis Bacon. Set for your home group? Yeah, not happy with that guy. Francis Bacon. Elizabethan England uh, really screwed us all up very badly. I almost want to dig into that. <laughs> It's the beginning of modernity. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we should do that one sometime. The New Organon? Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, let's do it here in a couple of weeks. I'm reading this damn thing anyway. That'd be so, easy for you, hard for me. A couple hundred pages. Oh, I don't care about that. <laughs> 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 uh, so... Uh, uh, music and ideas podcast that should come out just previous, just before this. This comes out on Thursdays. I think the Tuesday before this show uh, will be uh, Carl, Trent, and myself uh, discussing a little a little lost treasure uh, blues guitarist. I don't know uh, to say blues guitarist isn't fair. Really good guitarist Roy Buchanan. Um, I went to breakfast with a friend of mine this morning. Uh, he works at Online Great Books, in fact. He's a seminar host, and he's in my home group. He's a great guy. He said, how do you pick the topics for your podcast? And I said, well, the book podcast is just pretty much the things that Carl and I want to read, because that's the only way we can get them in. And the music and ideas one, we're trying to hit you know, the big, the big stuff, right? What's blues? The beginning of country music with Jimmy Rogers. Let's listen to Bach. Let's talk about temperament and tuning. Like, I mean, that's very basic, right? We need to know about tuning mm -hmm. before we understand anything about music. And he says, yeah, I haven't really seen anything that's interesting to me. And I was like, well, you're, you're screwing up because <laughs> the show is excellent. And he's like, well, I've just been listening really to just folk music lately. And I was like, well, go listen to the Jimmy Rogers episode and go listen to the Bill Monroe episode, you dummy. You know, go listen to the blues mm -hmm. episode. They're all they're all related to folk music because what we typically call folk music is really an invention of the late forties and the early fifties in the United States. You know, but, but uh, you might find somebody like Pete Seeger that digs up an old song from Appalachia in the eighteen eighties, but it's really a fairly new thing. And and we talk about some of the the, the musical movements that lead up to it. He's like, oh, I guess I will listen to those. So anyway, uh, you might go listen to them too. I'm proud of the show. I think we yep. do a good job. Trent mixes it. It yep. sounds great. I think we say interesting things. I land a fart choke every now and then. It's great. <laughs> yep, I agree. Tell your friends. Uh, I made a challenge. You haven't responded to it yet. Uh, yeah. Somebody wanted us to do Weird Al. And I said, if you got our weekly downloads to some number that Scott will provide, we'll do Weird Al Yankovic. Well, the thing about the music and ideas show is the numbers are so bad. I don't even want to just. I don't even want to say, you know, what they. Well, you could give a percentage increase. Oh, listen, they need to double. Like they're low enough that doubling is not a big ask. All right, so that's the number. Yeah. If, if they double, Weird Al Yankovic. 
And I won't lie about it. If they double, I will say they have doubled and we'll do one on one Weird Al, which we've talked about anyway. That wouldn't be horrible, would it? It would be Al fantastic. Show. Yeah, it wouldn't be bad. Ah. Uh, so, yeah, go listen to the Roy Buchanan one. And then uh, after that, we have Buddy Holly, and I'm almost certain to cry. Hmm. Anything else, Carl? No. Go read some Walker Percy. You might like it. Yeah, do what Carl says. Talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.